Thanks. Testing, is that on? Can you hear me? Yep, excellent. Thanks very much, Drew. Um, yeah, I'm still not sure how they came, you become Newcastle Citizen of the Year. I think it was um, very strategic from Newcastle City Council in a, in a year of a referendum with The Voice. Um, all of a sudden, they say, congratulations, you're Newcastle Citizen of the Year, and can you now come and speak at all these events? So, lucky me, but it was a very big honour, and thank you very much for that introduction. Um, yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, Nathan Townie's my name. I'm a Radjuri man from Wellington, New South Wales. Um, as Drew said, I was in the department uh, for a little while, um, studied PE teaching here at the University of Newcastle, um, taught at uh, a few different places, Scone in the Hunter Valley, um, North Sydney Girls High School, went from North Sydney Girls to Granville Boys High School, uh, went in as an Aboriginal education consultant, uh, worked there managing the Aboriginal education team for South Western Sydney, uh, from there to Wadawa Community School, I believe there's some of my ex-colleagues in the room from Wadawa, hello, uh, and then to Newcastle High School, so um, that's basically my education journey. Before I start, I just as a cultural protocol for me, it's just important that I let everybody know that there are some images I'll be showing of, of Aboriginal people that have, that have passed away. Um, so really important thing for me. Um, I'd also like to begin by acknowledging that we are meeting on the unceded lands of the Awabakal and Waramai people. Um, I believe you had a, an amazing acknowledgement, welcome to country by Alex Neen and a crew from Callaghan College yesterday. Um, so I'd also just like to pay my respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to the homelands of all of you. Um, we all have connections to place. We all have connections to people that occupy those places. And they play a significant role in why we end up doing what we're doing and the way that we do it because of those values and um, the influence that those people had on you. So just want everyone to take a moment just to think about those people, who they are, the impact that they've had on your life, whether they're with us or not. Um, this is a picture of my dad, who we lost, it'll be two years in July. Um, he's sitting on the lands where he grew up, um, which is the common, um, just outside Nenema Mission, um, just near Wellington, New South Wales, which is where I grew up in the town, but um, where dad's sitting there is a really significant place to us as a family, and somewhere where I take my two children, Archie and Charlotte, nine and six, uh, back there as much as I can, so that they can connect with that place, and they can um, reminisce about the stories they heard from their pop, and I'm able to, to reinforce that cultural identity for them, something that's really important for us. Um, when I acknowledge country, I acknowledge um, the, the earth, the, the sky, the waterways, and all the living things that occupy those spaces, and the unique spiritual relationship that exists between all those things as well. It is a very unique thing. Um, right, so I'm going to get started. I'm going to, I'm going to um, preface... I guess, what I want to talk about with, with a, a few little stories, because I think um, narrative's a really important part of, of the quality teaching framework. Uh, I think it, it really does help people resonate with particular things. And so, um, this picture up here, uh, this, let's see if this clicker works. No, nah, the laser's not working. That's all right. On your right, um, in this old picture, the person in the middle, that's my dad, at the Nenema School. Um, took Dad six years to be able to look at that photo, and the photo is much bigger. There's a lot more people in it, so it's got a lot of my aunties and uncles and extended family um, that are in that photo as well. But Dad really struggled looking at the photo. He'd get angry, he wouldn't want to look at it, um, and it was something that obviously resonated, brought up a lot of feelings of that time. He hated the fact that he had no shoes on, he hated the fact that he was wearing those types of clothes, which, you know, probably quite common back then. Um, but it obviously reminded him of the experiences that he felt in that school. And the reason I put these photos up is I want us to think about what education has looked like across three generations of my family. So if you think about my dad's experiences, I think about the types of things that he was learning about the type of professional learning that his teachers might have had. I reckon the, the um, significance element of the quality teaching framework might have been pretty useful back then um, because I don't think they were really thinking too much about those types of things in a school with all Aboriginal students. And so when you think about what was the role, what role did school play back then, it was very much about assimilation. It was very much about trying to 
ensure that Aboriginal children were, were able to fit into a, a particular way of living in a particular society. Then I think about my experiences. Um, I'm 43, I was born in 1980, um, you know, and I would say that the purpose of school wasn't that much different. Uh, I went to school at Wellington High School. We had, oh, I reckon it was about 80% population of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students, 99% of them were my cousins. And, um, you know, I think about the amazing people, some of them in this photo, that lived in our community that our school never tapped into. It was never a priority to, to think about what well, was never valued. Cultural knowledge, history, local story was something that just wasn't seen as valued and important. When we learnt about history, we learnt about the explorers that came over the mountains, battled with the Wiradjuri people around Bathurst, conquered that area, moved forward, created Wellington, um, you know, and our sports houses were named after those people. Um, but yet there was no relevance or, or um, acceptance or acknowledgement of our local history and those local people that were really important in our community. That knowledge is still there, but we never got a chance to experience any of that. I remember having NAIDOC days. That's the only thing I remember from a cultural element of my schooling, um, and it was a highlight of the year. Um, it was, we, we had NRL players that would come, Aboriginal NRL players that would come. There'd be a sprint race at the end of the day. I remember it vividly because everyone just loved NAIDOC day at our school. It was the only time we really saw our Aboriginal families come into our school, not my dad. Um, it wasn't until I went to uni and learned about some of the policies that were in place um, in this state that I started to reflect on maybe why dad never came to anything at my school. And then when we found that photo, this was after I went to uni and it took us six years to be able to talk about it, that just reinforced to me why dad never came to anything at my school because schools were scary places and they still are for some Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families. So I just want to preface that. Then I think about Archie. This is his first day at kindergarten. He's now in year four at the Junction Public School. Any teachers here from the Junction? Yes, excellent. I was going to say I'll have to have a word with Kath if there's no one here. Excellent. Thanks, mate. And so I've got Archie and Charlotte there, year one and year four. Archie's a bit tall, a bit smellier now. Um, but I think about the experiences that he's going to have and Charlotte's going to have through their schooling. And I'm really excited to think that we have moved a little bit from a curriculum base, from a staff professional learning base, from a cultural capacity and cultural responsiveness space, that my kids will actually, you know, that, that cultural identity will some, be something they can be really proud of, and they have been already. Um, Archie's in a dig group, he, he's, you know, he's, he's able to express culture, he's able to teach people, he's able to share stories of going back to our special places with my dad, with me, and share those stories. We had a teacher, Matt Lyle, uh, acknowledge Matt, who came out to Wellington, uh, a few years ago over the Christmas holidays and he actually rang me, I think Archie was in year one and he rang me and he said, mate, Archie's told me so much about Wellington and Nanama and I'm actually in town, is there any chance you could go and show me around? And so my dad, myself and Archie jumped in the car, went and picked him up and we spent three hours with him taking him around um, the Nanama mission and the common where dad grew up and shared those stories. Um, it was an amazing thing and that was a teacher in the school that just proactively rang because we he was in our community, we were home for Christmas um, and it was an amazing thing. I got a phone call from the principal, Kath Larkman, who said um, she asked Matt to share that experience at the staff development day and as he started to talk, he couldn't talk because he was too emotional um, about the impact that that had on, on him to be able to learn all that cultural knowledge and learn more about our family and which resonates as across all of their Aboriginal families. So uh, I just want to acknowledge Matt for taking that time and effort. And that's the type of experience that my kids are going to get in that school, and that really excites me. Um, there are two quotes that I guess I lived by um, through, my, through my teaching career. And I guess the bottom one is why I, I became a teacher. That's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be that champion in a young person's life that maybe didn't have that. And so that is something that really resonated with me. If you haven't seen Rita's TED Talk, I'm sure you have because I know it gets floated around lots on staff development days and different things, but if you haven't, it's a very good use of time. But then I started to think about that quote when I got into leadership. Well, it's not just every child that deserves a champion. It's also every staff member. 
And if I'm a head teacher, then I need to be the champion for my staff. If I'm a deputy principal and I have a, a few faculties that I look after, I need to be a champion for those head teachers and the staff that sit under them. And I need to encourage my head teachers to be the champions for their staff. And if I'm a principal, then I need to be a champion for all my staff. And how do I create time to be able to do those things? What are the things that I need to do to, to really be that champion for people and create a culture where we, we support each other and champion each other? The other is, is one thing that um, I, I learned from a, a very influential person in my life that I'm going to talk a little bit about today, and that's uh, Linda O'Brien. Does anyone know, here you know Linda? Yes, one few people. Excellent. Linda was the principal at Granville Boys High School. Um, she was the, my, my second year at Granville Boys, I was there for seven years. In my second year, we had five principals. She was the fifth one. And anyone that knows Linda, she's about this tall and she, she walked in with purple hair and we thought, oh, here we go again. Uh, but she stayed there for 12 years, I think, and just absolutely changed that place. And this quote resonates with me when I think about what we did at that school. I, I went from classroom teacher to head teacher to deputy principal under Linda at Granville Boys High School, and she changed the way that I think about um, educational leadership. And she was very, very strategic. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But that quote for me is important in a personal sense and in a professional sense. And, you know, from a, at Newcastle High, something that, you know, as, as a senior executive, we talked about a lot. From a front office staff perspective, we talked about a lot. When they are often that first interaction, it, whether it be on the phone or in person with a staff member, a student who needs help or a family that needs help. And the way that we interact with those people sets a, a really clear culture of what people expect when they come into our environment. So those two quotes are, are things that have resonated and guided me. The next term I want to talk about is, is a term of custodianship. So when we acknowledge country, we, we always acknowledge the traditional custodians, the people that, that, that have looked after this land for a long period of time. There are custodians now that need to look after that land. But we're all custodians, not just of country, but of other things. So for me, when I started to think about my professional life as a custodian, it started to change the mindset that I had and how I approached my work. So if I think about when I became a head teacher PE at Granville Boys High School, obviously there was someone that was in that role before me. They were the custodian. They did things that allowed me to then step into that role and do particular things. Then when I moved into the deputy role, someone came in behind me. And so no matter what role we're in, we're generally a custodian of that particular role. And we have obligations and responsibilities that come with that custodianship, just as those traditional custodians have with land. There are, there are responsibilities and obligations that we have. I think about my current role. What are my obligations and responsibilities? I have cultural responsibilities and obligations. So I get phone calls from Aboriginal people from all across Australia who know me through a Koori network. Um, you know, Aboriginal people are a bit like that and just ring the mobile and say, hey, mate, my daughter went for a scholarship at the uni. Um, can you make sure she gets it? Um, those types of phone calls, true story. Um, I get those phone calls at least once a week. And for me, there is a, there is a cultural obligation that I, I'm able to, maybe not necessarily guarantee she'll get the scholarship, but at least pick up the phone and have a conversation and talk about what the process is. And so I think when we think about our roles as custodians, it's a privilege. It's a privilege to be able to work in the spaces that we work in. As a teacher, like, and as a school principal, I just, and now that I'm not in the role, I see how much of a privilege that was to watch young people come into our school as 12 year olds and then go through that journey with them until they are 18. So much happens in a young person's life from 12 to 18 years of age. And then to be able to continue that relationship and connection beyond their schooling as well, is something that is really important to me. And so all of that is something that I talk about around this concept of belonging. For me, there is nothing more important than creating environments where people want to be, where people feel as though they are valued and where they belong. 
Um, this is something that I'm exploring my own um, PhD journey. Uh, I don't know why I'm doing this, but I think when you move into the higher education sector, to get that kudos, you've got to do your PhD. So, yep, wish me luck. Um, but basically what I'm doing is I'm trying to understand and explore what is it that, that school leaders do to create a culture where people want to be? What, what are those daily things that people do? Because I watched Linda do it and I watched her transform a school and I think it's important for any school. Foundationally, if you don't have those connections and relationships with people, then you can try all these other things but they're not going to be as effective as they could be if you've got people on board. And to me, those connections and relationships are the foundational key for that. I think about some of the things that Linda did at the school. She created a really clear vision, first of all. Then she got the right people around her in the right positions. And then we um, created time and space to connect with people. She wanted people, she wanted us as a senior executive to, to know people. So my, our day would start, the senior executive's day would start at 7.30. We'd come into the office, we'd have a look at the day sheet and we'd say, right, who's away? Um, where do we need presence? Uh, as a deputy principal, I didn't have an office. I was basically on my feet all day. Uh, as soon as that meeting finished at about 8 o'clock, I would head down to Granville train station, uh, which was a bit of a melting pot for where our boys would go and possibly sometimes organise to meet up other boys from other schools and do things that they shouldn't be doing. Um, there was a bit of a culture of that. And so being, um, Linda had sort of three, uh, three mantras, to be visible, to be active, and to be strategic. And if we were those three things and we centred those around connecting with people, then we would create a culture of belonging. And we would, we would create this place where people wanted to be. So we were not only visible and active to our students, we were visible and active to our staff. They felt supported. We knew them, we understood their lives and what was going on, but also our community, we were visible and active in our community. As I headed down to the train station, I'd say hello to about 30 shopkeepers on my way down, if anyone knows the main strip of Granville. Um, I'd then play the sheepdog role and herd everybody up to, up to school where all ex senior executive members would be waiting at the front gate and they'd shake every student's hand as they walked through the gate. They'd wave to every parent the exact same way um, we're creatures of habit as human beings, aren't we? Um, it'd nearly be the same time. Every parent would drop off and you'd do the same wave. Um, and it made a hell of a difference to actually spend time connecting with people and starting the day in a really positive way. And it started to change the way that the boys felt about coming into that place. And all of a sudden, we started to see a shift. Belonging at school is something that I think is now starting to get the traction and, and the research that it deserves. Often people thought that you know, this concept of belonging is, is really a, um, I guess, a, a soft thing that doesn't really matter. It's not really going to improve learning outcomes a hell of a lot. And so we really need to focus on the things that matter, not so much those soft skills. But there's a body of research now that's happening that actually says if people feel as though they belong in a school setting, then it actually has a major impact. It actually impacts on people's mental health massively. It impacts the way that they engage, whether it be a staff or a student member, a uh, student or staff member, um, and it improves learning outcomes. There, there is research now that is telling us that. And so if that's so important as a foundational piece, why don't we talk about these things more? As a department and as a system, um, people have always told me that relationships are so important, but until I worked with Linda, no one had really shown me how to do it and what it actually looked like and what it felt like and the power of it. And so that is something that I guess is really guiding and, and encouraging me to continue to move the direction that I'm moving. When I left Granville Boys, uh, I went into a consultancy role and then I went to Wadawa Community School and, hello Lee, uh, and when I moved into that role, I, talk at my, I remember my job interview and I talked about some of those things that we did at Granville Boys and how I would like to continue doing those things and create this culture at Wadawa. Um, and I remember my first, first day, it was an early start at Wadawa, um, and I, I thought, I'm going to start by getting out at the front gate um, every morning and doing those same things and waving and 
you know, welcoming people. I'm the new deputy principal. Um, I think some people thought I was a bit mad. It was cold. Um, but I did it consistently for two years uh, when, while I was there. And there's, there's one little story I just want to share about a young, a young boy who um, was in year seven when I arrived at the school. And it was the beginning of the second year that I was there, but he was a, he was a fanatical golfer. And I'm, I'm a golf tragic. I'm not very good, but I love it. And we would have a conversation every morning about golf on his way into school. And uh, I never taught him. He, he wasn't in one of my year groups as a deputy principal. But we talked about golf, um, particularly more so on a Friday and a Monday, because both of us would play on Saturday. And we would talk through basically our whole round of golf. Um, on a Monday, and on Friday he would tell me where he's playing, who he's playing with, what event it was. Yeah, anyone that's a golfer will know that that's very important information. Anyway, something really tragic happened in that family. And the mother came to the front office and she asked to speak to me. And the front office lady said, oh, look, um, I think Nathan's quite busy. Uh, this young person doesn't sit with, with Nathan. I'm going to call his relevant deputy principal. And the mother said no. And I'd never spoken to the mother. I'd waved to her probably 400 times in the car. Um, but she said, I only want to speak to Nathan. She was visibly getting upset, so the office lady just went and got me. And we went and sat down. And we, we, we worked through supporting this young man around this tragic accident. And I think it was at that time that um, the principal at the time and the, the other deputies really... Um, started to talk to me about the impact that standing at that front, front gate had um, because that mother felt as though we had this connection that benefited her son in a way that she was able to, to feel the confidence in me to be able to support him and the family through that situation and that's something that I'll never forget around just standing at that front gate and how important that was for me. I now just want to talk a little bit more about the quality teaching framework and how all of that, what I've just said relates to this dimension of the quality teaching framework. Because to be, to have learning that is significant, we need to know people. We need to understand them. We need to be responsive to the needs of people. And when I think about my dad's experiences, I'm not, I won't think you're rude, come and sit down, there's lots of seats down the front, come and sit down. Um, when I think about my dad's experiences, you know, learning wasn't significant to him or those around him. That's why dad left school at the end of year four. He went and carted rocks to build the Burrandong Dam wall, if anyone knows Burrandong Dam. He did that for years because our family didn't see the relevance or significance in school. It was about trying to assimilate those young people into a particular system. And so if we want learning to be responsive, we need to have background knowledge of our students. We need to understand the cultural background. We need to understand the cultural knowledge that they bring to our classrooms and the things that they can do for our classrooms. Um, I think it's a really important thing. We also need to think about that our schooling system as a, as a system, probably isn't as responsive as it needs to be. You know, I, I had a catch up with Murat last week. We've developed a culturally responsive evaluation framework for the New South Wales Department, which will be launched um, this year. And for me, this is, this is a small step in the department trying to shift and change the way that they measure success. If you look at how success is measured at the moment, it is measured by a political term. It is a politician that might set some targets or some things that we have to um, try and meet. That drives professional learning that happens in schools. It, it drives the structure of the system itself to try and support those particular aims that a politician or, or a political um, group have decided that this is what success should be for our young people. Um, as a father of Archie and Charlotte, no one's asked me what, what success should look like for them. And, you know, and we had these conversations with Murat, and is it up to a Premier to set these priorities for my kids 
and tell, which then drives behaviours that happen in, at, at, in their classrooms at the Junction Public School. Well, yeah, there's probably an element where that, that's important, but there is also an element where we actually need to be responsive of the needs of, of the students and the families. Like, what does success mean to our families? What, what do they want for their children? And how does that information get collated and actually inform the system? so that the system can make decisions based on that information, not just from the top down based on what they think is important that will get them re-elected. And so our framework is about that. It is about Aboriginal students and family sovereignty at the centre with five principles that sit around that, which basically, I guess, unpack some of the things that I've talked about today. We need to have strong relationships. We need to think about yarning and, and having conversations with people, which is very similar to narrative. There's some little nuances to yarning, but it's very similar. Place is an important cultural principle for us. Just because something worked in New at Newcastle High doesn't mean it's going to work at Lambton High <laughs> or at Walgett. Place is such an important part. There is local story, local people that need to be part of the decision-making process there. So when we try to create a, a statewide measure of success, straight away it, it's, it's a bit flawed. And we, we need to really think about what does place-based success measures actually mean? And so that's something that we're working really closely with uh, the department on at the moment and something that I'm really excited about being launched um, later this year. We're actually using that framework to, to do some evaluation work for the department at the moment. So the connected community strategy, um, people have heard of the connected community strategy, we're, we're currently evaluating that. We're also evaluating the, um, the Aboriginal elements of the Premier's priorities, which is really interesting because we didn't use the framework to develop those things. So we didn't ask Aboriginal families or students what the priorities should be, but now we're gonna use the framework to determine whether or not it was successful. So that's an interesting process in itself. Um, I'm also conscious that I want to allow um, some time for some conversation and questions because I really want to get to, I guess, some, um, some people in the room that might have experienced some similar type of um, some things in schools. And so I'm going to just finish off with, with one last thing, and, and that is some of the, the strategies that I've implemented post Wadaba, post Granville, um, things that I, I guess have learnt along the way that have worked for me in trying to, I guess, re-emphasise this culture of belonging. So I talked a little bit about standing at the front gate, being visible, active and strategic. That's a mantra that I've carried through with me in every role that I've had since Granville Boys. So when I went to Newcastle High, um, similar type sort of thing. We, we had a senior executive that um, hadn't really fought that way before. And so, uh, you know, I'd started to stand at the front gate, um, realised that not many students actually come through the front gate. They, th there's four entries into Newcastle High, a lot of students um, head down to Market Town before school. Um, and Market Town was a bit, a bit like the Granville train station, just not quite as intense. Um, so I realised, well, I need to be visible down at Market Town. So um, we'd have our meeting at 7.30 every morning. The senior executive loved me for that. Um, and then we, would, then we would all break off and there would be one person at every entrance. So we couldn't not miss one student. Um, and I would head down to Market Town and then make my way up and then stand at the front gate. And I got to know the, the ladies at Coles down at Market Town very well. Um, you yeah, know, we'd, we'd say good day. Uh, we would also give them, at uh, Newcastle, we had these things called gotchas. So it was a PBL initiative where you catch someone doing something really positive. Um, started giving gotchas to the shopkeepers down at, um, at Market Town because we'd often get phone calls when I started. You got kids down here doing things they shouldn't be doing. So they noticed all the negative things, but we wanted to actually get them to rethink uh, what they were seeing as well because we had so many great kids that were doing amazing things down there and helping people but we never heard about those things so the gotchas were a, were a great um, thing that we implemented because all of a sudden and if they got a, um, a community gotcha then they actually got an instant prize. Everyone, every, all the other gotchas went into a barrel and they, um, they got drawn out so it became very clear to the students because the prizes were quite good 
uh, very quickly that if they were good at market town, they could get a prize. And so all of a sudden, we had kids putting trolleys away. They were, <laughs> they were trying to help old ladies with their shopping. Um, and it was an amazing uh, little thing. We actually had to stop that because there were, we were running out of prizes. There were too many, too many good things happening. Um, the other strategy that I just want to... There's two more that I just want to touch on. Um, and this one was probably one of the most effective things that we did. And it started as one of our prof professional learning days, which was focused on Aboriginal education. It was some strategy that I, that I did on this day, and then we continued to do in other, other ways. But what I did, we, we were learning about the Aboriginal education policy. Um, I had half the staff bus to Glenrock, and they were doing an on-country experience there with, with some cultural educators, and the other half were with me at an Aboriginal organisation we were learning and talking through the policy, what it meant for us in classrooms, what it meant for us um, with our students. And in the room, I had all of our 100 and, I think there were 130-odd Aboriginal students at the time, and I had their faces on an A3 piece of paper printed out around the room. And one of the activities that we did, I asked all the staff with a sticky note to go and write anything they know about each of those kids. What, what do we know about these, these students? Some of them had up to 12 uh, teachers in a fortnight, and I just really wanted to get a sense of, do we know these kids? How well do we know them? How, how, how deeply do, do we have these connections? And it became really clear, really quickly, which teachers had strong relationships with these students, which teachers knew absolutely nothing about these people. And also, when you looked around the room, there were some students that had covered in sticky notes. We knew lots about those students, but then there were some that had one or two um, sticky notes. And so, really quickly, we could tell we need to be a little bit more strategic about forming relationships with these young people. We need to spend time and effort getting to know them. We don't, we don't apply that significance dimension well enough for those particular students. And so, what is it that we can do to spend time and effort getting to know them? When we're on playground duty, where does that person sit? All right, well, if you're on playground duty in that area, let's make an effort to go down and talk to them just informally. Which entrance do they come in of, of a morning? Right, we need to be a little bit more strategic and pull them up. How do they get to school? Do their parents drop them off? If they do, we need to stop the parent and just say good day and start to build that relationship. And that started to shift and change the way that we operated and the way that we actually spent our time and being strategic about that belonging culture, not just something that happened by chance. And that was a strategy then. The, it was about... Uh, it, would, it would have only been two weeks after that that the year eight year advisor came to me and said, Nathan, can, at a staff meeting, can we do that for year eight? Because I feel like our staff don't know them. Year eight, year nine, beautiful year groups. Uh, I know you, they're all your favorite classes, those high school teachers in the room. Um, and we did it for all of year eight. Then we started to say, well, we, we need to um, be a little bit more strategic about this as well. And so then we created a database where we collated all this information and people if they had a class then that they hadn't had before or the following year, there was a database and they could look up and create their class list and actually find out all this background information about these particular students that other teachers knew about them. So we were leveraging other people's relationships, which was a really important thing for us and it worked exceptionally well. Um, then I would just randomly at staff meetings put photos up and we would, we would do it just for, for random kids. But... Um, the other thing that it influenced for me as a principal is I, I needed to make an effort for those students that had no sticky notes or only one or two, I personally made it my, uh, my mission to reach out to those students and those families. So I would walk down every lunchtime to get my lunch from the canteen um, and then walk back to my office and I would spend the whole lunchtime getting there and then getting back so that I was in the playground doing those things every lunchtime. And so I strategically found where those students sat, went and had those conversations myself. And then I started every Friday, the last thing I did before I left school was to make five phone calls, um, five positive phone calls before I walked out that office. No matter how busy or hectic my week was and how quickly I wanted to get to the Commonwealth Hotel to meet with my staff, I would not leave without making those five phone calls. And I would make sure that some of those students that didn't have many sticky notes, that I found a way to acknowledge and find something that they did 
that was positive. And I would ring their parents on a Friday and say, I just wanted to ring and let you know that I, I, I saw such and such do this thing today. And we found those, because those sticky notes weren't very, there weren't many sticky notes, the parent engagement wasn't strong either. And then all of a sudden that started to shift and change the way that those parents started to engage and the way that they felt about the school. So it wasn't just becoming this belonging culture for the students, but also for the families. They started to come to things. Um, they started to engage and ask questions, and then all of a sudden you could see the, the shift and change in how the students felt about being there. Um, it was really interesting. Every time I made those phone calls on a Friday afternoon, the five students that I called, 90% of the time, the five of those students would come and find me Monday and thank me, and they would you know, have their chest out and, you know, it meant a lot. And for me, that strengthened my relationship as a school leader with, you imagine you make five phone calls every week, that you're hitting a lot of students. And so that was something that was really beneficial for me and um, something that I will, uh, that I continue to do now. They're not always phone calls in my role as PVC, but I, I will either make five phone calls or emails. Um, so it might be two phone calls, three emails. Um, something every Friday before I leave and turn off my computer on a Friday afternoon. It sets the right tone for me for the weekend and makes me feel as though um, I, I've yeah, finished the week off on a high. Thank you very much.